This is Beyond Species, a podcast exploring issues around speciesism and the struggle to dismantle it. I'm Tofu Steve, and welcome to the episode. In this episode, we hear from Lauren from the Food Empowerment Project. Lauren explains how food justice is central to FEP's advocacy for social justice for both human and non-human animals. We hear about some of the initiatives taking place, including the chocolate list, and how a plant-based diet doesn't necessarily equal an ethical one. We also hear from Lauren about the importance of a decolonial approach to understanding diets and how chapter-based activist groups can be damaging to the grassroots movement. Do you want to start then by telling us some of the background and history of Food Empowerment Project? Absolutely. So basically, I've been involved in the animal rights movement since 1987. And my background is doing a little bit of um, human rights stuff as well, and also, you know, my own life experiences. And I worked for a group based in England called Viva. And I ran the USA chapter for a number of years where I did investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses. And, you know, over time, I started to learn about more abuses in the food industry regarding um, uh, human animals and started to incorporate it a little bit more into my work at Viva, just in terms of talking about what was happening with chocolate and slavery and child labor and when I would do this, I would start to get pushback from vegans telling me that I was hurting the animals by talking about the other injustices in the food industry that involved human animals. Mm-hmm. And so I eventually, you know, I accepted it, but I wasn't happy about it because I'd been doing human rights issues before and I was vocal about it. But I think with Viva getting a little bit more popular, um, more people were starting to hear me talk this way. And so I went to speak at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela in 2006 and was really just invigorated, just inspired by all these different issues that I cared about that people were talking about from immigration issues to the environment to workers and water privatization. And I was there speaking on the connection between uh, the harm that um, factory farms cause workers, the animals and the environment. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, I just felt like, you know, I can't just do work to advocate the rights of non-human animals. I needed to work for everybody the same. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the the birth of Food Empowerment Project was me being at the World Social Forum and realizing I couldn't, I didn't feel like I wanted to have to choose anymore, that I felt like they were all important and that there was a way to connect them through food um, to try and make a difference in all these different ways. So what were the next steps then that you took in order to start kind of bridging that gap between advocating for human rights issues, but also for non-human animal rights? Well, in the very beginning of Food Empowerment Project, you know, we were all volunteer from 2007 until the fall of 2013. So in this time when we were just kind of getting our, you know, getting interested and doing more, um, we were mostly just talking about what was happening with farm worker justice issues, talking about what was happening with slavery and child labor in the chocolate industry and lack of access to healthy foods. And how we started to work on connecting these, one is I lived in an area that lacked access to healthy foods. So we started, we did our own, you know, we got all volunteers out to survey our community, to put out a report. We started working with other organizations that work on this issue. And it was mostly because it was something I'd seen, wanted to know if where I lived was one of those areas because where I lived was in the Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Um, Plus, just starting to connect with farm worker justice groups, learning from them, meeting them. And that was kind of really just starting to learn everything. The very beginning, we were really just learning. And after time, we learned the different ways that we could help. So with the farm worker issue... I went on a reality tour of where the farm workers work and where they live. And one of the things we were asked to do was to bring clothes or school supplies for the kids. And when a 
13 year old boy ran to a packet of pencils and was super excited about it, I realized, wow, this kid's so excited because this is about his future. This is about his education. Mm -hmm. So that's where we started working on school supply drive for the children of farm workers. And then with the chocolate issue, I would talk about chocolate and all that was involved in it. And people would say, what chocolate can I buy? So then we started investigating chocolate that we would feel comfortable recommending that wasn't sourced from areas where the worst forms of child labor and slavery took place. So a lot of it was just learning and then, you know, being open to the different ways in which we could try to help create change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how would you define the term food justice? Because that seems to be kind of central to what Food Empowerment Project does. And it's also a term that's used, I think, a lot more commonly um, these days within the vegan movement, thankfully. But how does that kind of uh, manifest itself? Well, I think for Food Empowerment Project, I think our definition is very holistic. So even some people, when they talk about food justice, they might just mean one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we talk about food justice, we're really talking about everything, everything in the entire food supply chain. So the people who pick and, you know, plant the seeds for the food that we eat, we're also talking about the drivers, we're talking about the grocery store workers, we're talking about the fast food workers, the restaurant workers. So we're including them as well as the farm workers. We're also talking about food justice in the sense of who's able to access healthy foods and who's not. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly what sets, sets us apart with other food justice groups is the fact that we talk about non-human animals who are raised and killed for food, whether that be the creatures in the seas or the animals on land, that all of that is part of food justice. When any form of these, which obviously all of them at this point, are dealing with oppression and exploitation, mm -hmm. our work is to try to figure out ways to right those injustices. So our definition of food justice is very holistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose um, it's maybe become a lot more apparent to the general public recently with the coronavirus thing. You know, the fact that there's been workers in slaughterhouses in the States who, you know, have become ill like the whole food supply chain has been put under pressure. We've realized that people on the front line, like food delivery drivers and food service, people working in the food service industry are obviously extremely important to our society, And but they're some of the lowest paid um, and, and are often exploited and not treated well by the companies that employ them. So um, it seems really quite topical at the moment that, people are starting to realize just how how convoluted and ex exploitative the food supply industry can be. Absolutely. And you got to remember, too, that these workers are deemed farm workers are, who pick our produce um, are deemed essential workers, yet they're reaping zero of the benefits. Mm -hmm. The way I look at this is that all of these problems have existed in the food industry but what's happened with COVID-19 is that it's just exacerbated them. It's made them all worse. Mm -hmm. And the public who, quite frankly, has never even, as a general whole, has never really thought about farm workers who have taken grocery store workers, fast food workers, restaurant workers for granted, mm -hmm. are now realizing how essential these workers really are and how much we absolutely need them. And yes, it's the hypocrisy of the fact that these are some of the lowest paid workers in our society. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a cruel irony, really. Um, it is. That that's the case. And have you found that since you started advocating for both human and animal rights issues within the animal rights or vegan movement, do you think you've seen progress in that direction in terms of more people starting to link those issues within their own advocacy? Or is it is it still kind of quite a niche? Because I'm getting the impression from at least the mainstream vegan movement that there is still a very, you know, for the animals only kind of approach, which kind, kind of seeks to downplay or not involve the human rights issues. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the thing. And it's in some ways, I want to say that, yes, I feel like more people are getting it. I feel like uh, black and brown activists get it. I, won't, I don't want to say whole, like everybody, but 
for the most part, they get it. Their family members have been impacted. They're seeing this stuff in their own lives. And so they are more open and willing to, to hear what we have to say. I think that there are also other vegans who are just, you know, are open and willing to be like, okay, right. My life experiences isn't like how everybody else's life experiences is. It's not easy for everybody to go vegan. I get that now. Hmm. But overwhelmingly, yes. Um, we just posted a blog that I had written asking vegans to have more compassion for slaughterhouse workers who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And we were pummeled with hatred and vitriol and some of the worst stuff I've ever seen. Now, I'm not on, I'm not on Facebook, so I'm not really that much on social media to mm-hmm. know that maybe this is common practice. But I was <laughs> shocked that people started attacking our ratings on Facebook that people started chasing our supporters from our page to their personal pages, uh, talking about how much they wanted these workers to die, saying that we were being paid by the animal ag industry, which is ludicrous if you really think about what we're saying in terms of the industry not treating the workers well, um, but also, you know, I, you know, it's hard for me because then I don't want to go on my own. Like I've investigated these places. I've been vegan for since 1988, you know, since a lot of you weren't even born yet. You know, I'm just like (laughs) holding that in as much as possible. Um, And all we're asking for is a little bit of compassion. We're not saying anything else, but just like as horrific as COVID-19 is, how much it destroys your body and the, the tragedy that it has on people's families. And for people who don't have many resources who are don't have health insurance who are already exposed to exposed to some of the major stresses that one can have in their life Mm -hmm. for people just to have a little bit of compassion for them was met with such hate that i was shocked Mm. Mm. yeah uh, i wish i could say i'm i'm surprised but unfortunately no right um yeah we do have a long way to go, I think, still in, in getting people to understand that the problem is really the systems that, mm-hmm. that are creating this, you know, and yes, there are people at the top kind of benefiting from these systems and, and that's why they're keeping them in place. But ultimately, you're not going to get anywhere by hating slaughterhouse workers. That's not going to, you know, people are are unfortunately often forced into doing work that they really wouldn't want to be doing exactly um but it's it's not going to get you it's not going to get you there you're aiming your your hatred at the wrong people you know exactly and the irony is is that one of these the things that we talk about as vegans is that slaughterhouse workers have one of the highest rates of turnover hmm. it's not like these people are staying at the jobs very long it's not like they're doing it because they want to do it and so to to be so hateful is just it, it's just sad You know, it's really sad Mm. that a movement about justice and compassion that we haven't extended our circle of compassion as wide as we're asking others to do for non-human animals. Okay, do you want to tell me about some of the projects that Food Empowerment Project's working on at the moment? Anything that's... um, taken up like a a lot of time for you or something really positive that's going on with Food Empowerment Project at the moment? Sure. You know, our work is broken down into four basic areas, veganism, farm worker justice, lack of access to healthy foods, and of course, the chocolate issue. So for right now, what we're doing for farm workers is we have, um, we had asked people to donate um, so that we could get food and supplies to farm workers. So we have been sending food and delivering food to farm workers, all vegan, of course. Mm-hmm. And over the next couple of days, I'll be packaging up some masks to send to farm workers. So that's kind of like the immediate thing we're doing right now for the farm workers. In terms of veganism, we are in the process of create. We have um, two websites: one vegan Mexican food, which is in English and in Spanish, and we have a booklet that goes along with that, which is also in English and Spanish which is full of recipes. Hmm. We also have vegan Filipinx food, which is in English and Tagalog, and that we are turning into a booklet now. So that is where a lot of time is going right now, is creating um, an actual booklet that we will be able to distribute um, in English and Tagalog. And then we're also working on um, vegan Lao food, 
Mm -hmm. And um, so if you have any listeners who are Lao, uh, we are definitely yeah. asking for recipes right now. Um, one of our board members is Lao. And so she's um, mm -hmm. looking to get more recipes for that. So that's some of the stuff we're doing in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. As many organizations and many NGOs around the world, I'm sure, having to adjust what we normally do. So our annual... Um, Vallejo, which is a city not far from from where I live, um, we do. Um, we're working on lack of access to healthy foods in that community, and one of the things we do is a vegan event every year where we serve free vegan food all day long and have performers and music and cooking demos and tables. And we're not going to be able to do that this year, so we're in the process of creating a different type of event. Um, again, this event is geared towards non-vegans. And so figuring out a way we can do an event that's going to be more personal for the people who actually live in that community. So I'm kind of excited about what we're, what we're dreaming up right now. So um, that's something else we're working on. Okay, great. And do you want to give us some more details then about the chocolate list and some of the issues around chocolate? Sure. So Food Empowerment Project started looking at what was happening in the chocolate industry in Western Africa because of a documentary I saw where the reporter had interviewed a former slave and asked them, what would you say to Westerners who still eat chocolate? Mm. And the former slave said, when you eat chocolate, you're eating my flesh. Mm. And I realized that that would be the same thing as a non-human animal would say. And I could never look at chocolate the same way again. And so um, what's happening right now in Western Africa, but also in Brazil, is that you have children who are working in the cacao industry, over 2 million in Western Africa, who are uh, victims of the worst form of child labor, including slavery. And basically what that means is you have children who are using hazardous equipment, such as machetes, to cut cacao pods out of the trees. They're getting scars on their arms and legs from you know, injuring themselves constantly. There, you have young kids who are lifting heavy cacao bags that weigh about 40 pounds, and if they don't move fast enough, they're beaten. Mm. You have the fact that many of them are locked in overnight, and if they try to escape, they're beaten. Mm. So all of this is for chocolate. And so what we're trying to do is remind vegans that just because something is vegan, meaning no animal products, doesn't necessarily mean it's cruelty-free if the product is at the hands of slaves or child labor. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've created a list of chocolate that we do and don't recommend and we explain why. And as a vegan organization, every company has to make at least one vegan chocolate. We update the list mm -hmm. every month and it's um, basically because of people who contact us and ask us to look into companies is how we update our list. And so, mm -hmm. You know, we, we are very transparent. We have companies we recommend, companies we don't recommend, and we explain why we don't recommend certain companies. Rather, it's that they're still sourcing in areas that child labor and slavery are prevalent. We don't recommend them because they didn't respond to us. Or worse, are the companies who will not be transparent about where their cacao is coming from. And why this is so reprehensible is one, because we're talking about child labor and slavery, but two, when we're asking where the chocolate is sourced from, we're not asking for a city. We're not even asking for a state. We're asking for country of mm. origin. And some of these companies are saying it's proprietary and that's just outrageous. Yeah. So we also have the list is in an app form as well for free where you know, people can download them. Okay. Mm. Yeah. That thing you said about how just because something's vegan doesn't mean it's necessarily cruelty free is an interesting one because again in the mainstream vegan movement there is kind of a common wisdom or a kind of mantra that vegan is the most ethical thing you can do it's like mm -hmm. the most ethical way to eat and, and have a lifestyle and obviously chocolate is like one of those kind of luxury goods that everybody likes to have and you know, when when you tell people you're vegan at work or whatever, and they say, oh, but can you eat chocolate? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you're always like saying, yeah, there's loads of different chocolates you can eat. You, you can get vegan chocolate now and so on. And I wonder how many of us actually stop to think that slavery and child labor still goes on. Yeah. 
probably not many. It's 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 not something I see highlighted very often, other than from you know yourselves. So yeah, it's it's not talked about very much at all. I think for me, I mean, it shakes me to my core. You know, to think that this is still happening for chocolate, that you know, my mind has a hard time with it. Like I just want to go out there and just like when if when I used to investigate, you know. Um, auction houses like it was so hard not to just run in the ring and stop it Hmm. you know that that this is still going on and i think that part of it is that you see so many organizations with our cruelty-free recipes or cruelty-free living and it's hard Hmm. because there are organizations that this is what they do there's a lot of people out there who are aware of it and they see something like that and they know better they know better Hmm. they know that it's it can't be cruelty-free because they know about what's happening in the chocolate industry And, um, you know, we're thankful that a lot of vegans have really, really gotten this. Um, And they have that Mm. same reaction that many of us did when we first learned about what was happening for cosmetics testing or what was happening to baby chicks. You know, that this gut reaction of like, I don't want to be a part of this. Mm. Um, And I'm very thankful for those vegans who get it. But, yeah, you know, there are the other vegans who constantly say, what does this have to do with veganism? What does this have to do with the animals? And for me, mm-hmm. you know, veganism is about justice and compassion. And so I'm, of course, of course, it's the same thing. I mean, I'm not saying vegan, it's part of veganism, but it is part of a more compassionate and cruelty-free lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you think then, just talking about um, how some brands market themselves as cruelty-free and things like that, I wonder where you stand on something like, for example, KFC or McDonald's, if they bring out vegan options. Often there's kind of celebrity social media influences in the vegan kind of, um, I would say, movement, but in a social movement who would recommend that vegans go and buy these options in order to create demand to make sure that these companies keep selling vegan things. So so maybe one day, you know, something like KFC might go vegan. What, what do you think about that kind of logic? I'm uncomfortable with it, honestly. I'm uncomfortable with it because these are still industries that are harmful to the environment and are harmful to workers. And again, at the end of the day, they're still killing other animals at their animals. But Mm -hmm. I think that it's not, that's not to say that I don't think it's a good thing. I think it's a great thing. I think that, um, you know, I remember being, you know, vegetarian and vegan living in Texas when I was really young and my family would go somewhere and there would be nothing for me to eat. I'm thankful for those people Mm -hmm. who in that, you know, instant in that pinch, they need somewhere, they need to get something to eat. Absolutely. But do I think Food Empowerment Project should be telling vegans to go eat there? No. Mm. The corporations themselves have enough money that they can promote these items if they want them to succeed. Mm -hmm. We have been through this time and time again with McDonald's and Burger King over the decades, Mm -hmm. coming out with veggie burgers and vegan burgers. And they haven't succeeded because, you know, it's not going to be just up to us. It's going to be the general public who is willing to try these that's going to, until we get our numbers to be bigger, it's going to be these, Mm -hmm. you know, these other people who are going to make it work. They don't need us to make it work. We don't, if Mm -hmm. if it violates your values and your ethics, I don't see a point. If other people want to do it, that's fine. But I certainly wouldn't encourage people to do it because I feel like the corporations have enough money out there to promote these products that I don't need my little tiny nonprofits, you know, time to be spent doing it. So I've seen you speak before about decolonizing the diet of people of color. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because it's not something I've really heard many people speak on, probably just from my own ignorance. But it's again, it's not something that's particularly a a common theme in vegan kind of uh, talk. Yeah, I I think that one of the things is is what we try to do. We're not necessarily talking about decolonizing one's diet as much as we're talking about the impacts that colonization has had on our diets. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because to decolonize your diet would 
also probably mean you don't eat a lot of um, plant-based foods because it wouldn't be to your, you know, to where your people came from, where your ancestors came from. So my ancestors came from the Americas. Uh, I'm Native American, I'm Mexican. And so my ancestors weren't vegan, but they didn't consume dairy and meat because Columbus is what, he's the one who brought cows over on his fourth voyage. So for us, you know, we didn't eat a lot of meat, my ancestors, but we did. We did eat some. You know, we weren't vegans. Our diet was a lot of plants. Absolutely. But what's happened is when you look at how colonization impacted our diets, I mean, if you want to look at what happened to our aunt, my ancestors, I mean, basically the Europeans who came felt as if they ate our food, they were going to become like, quote unquote, savages. Mm-hmm. And so by enslaving us, um, they introduced their own ways of, of cooking and being that then, you know, my ancestors had to deal with the repercussions. Mm-hmm. So how that's impacted us now, I think in many peoples who have been colonized, black and brown people, is that when you look at dairy. So when you consider that Columbus brought the cows over on his fourth voyage, dairy is something that many black and brown people do not digest. We don't digest milk very well. We're what's called, what is typically called lactose intolerant, but what Food Empowerment Project likes to call lactose normal. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing wrong with us for not being able to digest the milk of another species. Mm -hmm. And two, it's colonizers who brought that food to our lands. Mm -hmm. So that is where you really see the legacy of colonization because it still impacts us today. It impacted us then and it impacts us now because the fact that one, the dairy industry is going into schools all over the country. Hmm. Um, They have a huge advertising budget that people who are made to feel like, yeah, I want milk, I want ice cream for strong bones and a healthy body, but not realizing what's really being pushed on them that's something that's bad for their health. And it's bad for their health Hmm. because it's something that their ancestors never consumed to begin with. Mm-hmm. So um, that's kind of the, how we look at it is, is making sure that our people in our community say there's nothing wrong with me. I'm lactose normal. There's something wrong with Europeans who have this mutant that gene that allows them to digest cow milk. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's really also about empowering who we are and taking that back. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I suppose with the recipe books that you mentioned earlier, that's maybe a way of doing it is actually um, promoting vegan diets without necessarily saying, you know, let's say we can go back in time and eat like just exactly how we used to, but what can we do that's, um, you know, still in keeping with diets that existed before colonialization, but kind of give it a, a, you know, the vegan touch. Yeah, I mean, I think we should always be we should always be upfront about the fact that you know, at least for Food Empowerment Project, that we want people to go vegan for the animals. But th- there's always the added bonus that it's better for your health, and we don't do well with some of these products because they're not they're kind of foreign to our bodies. Hmm. So, you know, I think that that's that's a way for us to start talking about this. But I think it's obviously best for people who are black and brown, um, whose ancestors were colonized to be talking about this stuff, um, because it's going to resonate with people more because, you know, it's our peoples, it's our, it's our history. Yeah. Okay. So I also saw you do a talk, um, talking about grassroots activism and why you think that, um, having chapters of the organization is maybe not, the best way forward. And in fact, that some of these organizations that um, have gone out into the world and kind of created like a, almost like a franchise um, of all these chapters around the world is, is a form of colonialization as well. What are your thoughts on that? Thank you for watching that talk. <laughs> I don't feel like many people have seen it. Um, And I know that I was kind of just experimenting talking about it. So some of it was hard for me Mm -hmm. to get out. 
Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. this is an issue that I feel quite strongly about. And I think part of the reason why I feel so strongly about it is because I've been doing grassroots activism since 1987. And I feel like I've seen changes in this movement, both good and bad over the decades. And mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, I started my first animal rights group in my high school, then I started one in my college, then I started one in my city. And I ran um, a regional organization, regional chapter for a national organization. I've worked for national organizations. I ran a USA chapter for an English organization. So I feel like I have some experience with it as well. And with Food Empowerment Project, we had a Washington chapter, which was fantastic. And I loved, absolutely loved and adored everybody who was, who was in that chapter. And I still do. Um, but... Mm -hmm. In doing the chapter, I was always a bit uncomfortable with it. And that's why we only had one. And we only had one because the amazing activist, uh, whose name is Amika, is the one who convinced me to start it. And every time we tried to figure out how to make this be something that was, wasn't just this one, it was very difficult. And one of the reasons why it was difficult is because I was uncomfortable with it. Another reason is because our mission is so broad. And I'm very, very careful about, you know, what we do. So in a quick example is just that as an organization that believes in farm worker rights, doesn't want farm workers to be exposed to agricultural chemicals, we couldn't necessarily put our name on anything that involved animal testing hmm. to talk about how bad the chemicals were for workers because we didn't want to validate animal tests. So hmm. we've had to be very careful about this, we have to be very careful about who we associate with. So it was very difficult. And in looking at the state of the animal movement, I started to realize that I felt like chapters were kind of form of colonization in the sense that you have, or let's look at national organizations who are going into other countries and they're telling the activists there what they should, what they want them to do. So, you do this type of undercover investigation or you hand out this leaflet, like this very specific way they, that the activism has worked for their group in their home country, whether it be the United States or elsewhere. And this is what you want, we want you to do in your own country. Instead of saying, hey, we have this money we want to put in your country. Let's talk about what ideas you want to do. And we're going to fund you to do what you think and what you have found is effective in your country. Mm -hmm. We have groups in the United States who start chapters within the United States, and they're expecting activists to do similar actions that they did in California than maybe they would do in Georgia. Now, I've lived in Georgia. I've, I'm from Texas. I've lived in New Mexico. I've lived in California. I've lived in a lot of places and done grassroots activism in all of them enough to say that what works in California isn't going to work in Georgia all the time. Hmm. So why is it that we are pushing these types of things instead of letting grassroots activists be grassroots activists. So one, I find chapters to be a form of colonization. And two, I feel it stifles grassroots activism in their own ideas. When I first got started doing activism in the, like, in the late 80s and early 90s, there were groups all over the country with all their different names doing things in their own communities. It's not to say that we wouldn't then join in with larger national groups and help out with, say, a campaign against Procter & Gamble or Gillette or something, but we were also doing things in our own communities. And I feel like that that's gone a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's sad because everybody knows in their own community what's going to work and what is going to be the most important thing that they need to focus on. And I feel like instead what's happened is that people are more attached to brand names they want that group's T-shirt. They want that group's logo. They want it on their Twitter handle. They want it on there. And instead of being about the animals now, it's become the chapter. It's become the organizations instead of about the animals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really scary. Um, we were asked about starting a chapter in Brazil at one point. And when I told the activists, okay, well, it couldn't be called Food Empowerment Project, they were shocked. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but they don't, it should be in Portuguese. You know, so again, it's become about the names of the groups. Like, it's like a logo. It's about capitalism. It's about selling mm -hmm. stuff with your group's name on it. It's about having your group's name on a, a handle on social media versus about the actual content of the work mm -hmm. and the animals. 
And I feel that's mm-hmm. damaging. Yeah, I would agree. I, I also get that impression. And I feel like, um, I feel it's also disempowering to those grassroots oh. activists because instead of being able to, you know, think about what's best for your area with the people that you, you're doing the activism with, you've kind of got it all planned out for you and the signs are going to say a certain thing that you're going to protest with. And there's an organizer who's like in touch with a regional organizer and it, it comes top down, you know? Yeah. I think it is that kind of capitalist mindset that growth is good, Mm -hmm. that you need to replicate this over and over and over. And, and I think there's also a lot of people think as well that in order to be a united movement, we need to all, be under the same kind of brand Mm -hmm. yeah but i don't think that's necessary like you were saying that there were grassroots groups but they would you could still work together on certain things but everyone knows what's going on in their own area exactly and you know i mean that's the thing that happened with with the washington chapter too is realizing they had some ideas and i was like "Mm, but our work isn't really geared that way and i'm like but they're having ideas they're excited about what they want to do Mm -hmm. You know, but understandably, organizations have to make sure that everybody's following within the mission. Mm. And so absolutely, this has stifled grassroots activism because they have their own ideas and it may be based on those or, you know, other groups or within their own community, but they're not able to do it if they're under this label. Okay, well, we can't do it under this label. Okay, well, now we got to do it. Or they're Mm. saying things like, oh, we're a chapter that works on farmed animal issues. We can't turn around and say focus on the circus or SeaWorld or something else like that. You know, I mean, that's not Mm -hmm. how it should be. The animal exploitation that's happening in our communities is happening to a variety of animals. It's just not one type of animal that's being exploited. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's become about conquering the world and like, oh, now we have chapters in this country, Mm -hmm. in this country. And I know that I may be wrong. I may know that I may be the minority, but this is kind of where I am right now. And we dissolved our Washington chapter and I it was very sad. And they're still they still work with us um, and still would be there for any input on things they want to do in their community. But it's just what I feel is right. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know. Who knows? We're, we're hiring a new executive director. Maybe they will feel differently. But I really feel like I'd rather us remember it's about the animals and not names and that that people do have ideas and creativity. And that's some of what sparked that, too, is just watching creative activists from around the world hmm. protesting, you know, waste being dumped in their lands. In the Philippines, they had an amazing protest against the, you know, the global north dumping trash in the global south and these oh, yeah. everything they had was so creative these protests and these and i was like wow we just don't have that anymore like we used to because we're becoming so uniform mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i think that's a good way of putting it in order for us to be unified we're becoming more if, if things are becoming more uniform but there's there's no point it's like the the message is getting narrower and narrower and narrower in order to comply with like the the brand reputation and image, mm-hmm. but that's not that's not what we should be doing. We should be able to, we should be thinking of the bigger picture, not trying to just keep narrowing things into one kind of format. Yeah, that's what I'm hopeful for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very hopeful. Well, yeah, fingers crossed. I think I think more and more people are becoming aware of that. Um, that you know there's 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 a lot of issues with some of the larger kind of globalized um groups um and people are starting to realize that maybe maybe that isn't the right way so yeah fingers crossed yeah i i think that too is that people are experiencing this on their own they're like seeing what it's like Mm -hmm. like oh i don't have the ability to do whatever i want and once they realize that it's okay they're still going to be an activist. You can still be an activist without being part of one of these chapters. So what can we do then to support food justice? So like a a non-mainstream veganism approach or what kind of sort of direction could we be working in to to make things better it's a great question uh i would say that i think 
promoting, I will always say promoting the voices of black and brown vegans who understand the holistic perspective is important. Mm -hmm. I think that making sure that we, I mean, and again, just because of my most recent experience seeing what happened to FEP was not allow bullying to happen. Um, because I think that people who are wanting to support um, food justice, um, who are vegan, need to be supported and not be bullied. Just like when people go vegan, we don't want their families or friends bullying them. Mm -hmm. We should show that same compassion to people who are just starting to open their eyes and their minds to a different way of being, uh, to, to open their minds to noticing the suffering of others. And, and for a lot of people, that's what veganism did. We stepped outside of ourselves. We saw the suffering of non-human animals. And some of us start to look at other humans and their suffering. Mm. And I think that if we can stop some of this self-righteousness, I think that would be good. And, and we should be supporting each other for being more compassionate instead of tearing each other down.